So uh, very excited to be here and amazing uh, talks. Uh, whoever followed the previous uh, lectures, I think will uh, it will fit nicely into this one. So I'm sure you'll see the relevance. Um, and uh, I would like to talk to you about uh, a, a very interesting situation. Imagine waking up one morning to find out that your beloved open source database or, or any other library or tool at the heart of your system suddenly changes its license. At my company, we faced that twice uh, over the past year alone. Uh, it was a painful and uh, insightful experience and that uh, drove me uh, to uh, uh, suggest this uh, talk topic. Uh, I called it uh, when your open source turns to the dark side. <laughs> so um, I'll go over our story uh, with uh, Elasticsearch relicensing. And then I'll zoom out into several uh, different case studies from the past year or so of uh, open source turning to the dark side, going non-open source, going copyleft, going rogue, uh, different case studies. And, and then I'll talk about learnings, both for uh, using open source, for vetting uh, uh, a new open source for a company and for building uh, open source. And let's start with, with uh, uh, a few words about myself. My name is Dutan Horvitz. I'm a developer advocate at uh, Logs.io. Uh, at Logs.io, we provide the cloud-native observability platform that's based on, on popular open source tools, such as Prometheus, Jaeger, Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, and, and so on. That's, uh, that's why it's relevant for, uh, for my, uh, my company as well. Uh, I've been around uh, quite some time. I'm an advocate of, of open source uh, and, and communities. I run the local CNCF chapter uh, uh, in Tel Aviv, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So you're welcome for, uh, for our meetups if you're around. I also have a podcast, uh, Open Observability Talks, about open source-based observability and, and DevOps. Uh, and in general, you can find me everywhere at Horovitz. And let's go straight to, uh, to our own uh, experience. Um, it's been uh, the beginning of uh, last year, 2021. It was the second week of January as, as everyone's getting back from, uh, uh, from the New Year's vacations, kickstarting a new year. And one morning, a bomb dropped on us. Uh, Elastic, Elastic NV, uh, uh, released an announcement uh, saying essentially that they're going to change the license of Elasticsearch and Kibana from Apache 2, uh, 2.0 to a dual license, uh, SSPL and uh, Elastic license. If you've attended the previous talk, you probably heard a lot about that. So I'm not going to uh, drill into that much. And it's going to take effect, effective the upcoming minor release 7.11. So back then we were 7.10. 7.11 came out uh, three weeks uh, later, I think, less than a month. It's going to be there already a done deal. Uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, Elk stack or the ELK, it's a very popular open source stack for uh, search and, and log uh, analytics that's based on Apache Lucene uh, open source. Uh, Elasticsearch is the database. Kibana is the UI. And then you have Logstash and other uh, pieces for ingestion, instrumentation, like Filebeat and client libraries and so on, all of which used to be Apache uh, 2.0 licensed. As I mentioned, I work at, at Logs.io. So we provide uh, a, an observability platform that's built on, on uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana. So uh, Elasticsearch database is at the core of our system. It's a critical system. Uh, we've been investing in tweaking and optimizing Elasticsearch and Kibana for our use case for years. Uh, so you can only imagine the impact uh, seeing this announcement suddenly uh, one morning. It was, in fact, even more confusing because the announcement was titled uh, um, Doubling Down on Open. So I don't know, maybe we've missed something here. Uh, also, if you read the announcement uh, right on the, on the first paragraph, uh, you can see this license change ensures our community and customers have free and open access to use, modify, redistribute, collaborate on the code. So, you know, free and open, maybe it's not an issue. Maybe the relicensing is, is okay. Maybe, maybe SSPL is a, a open source uh, software. Uh, spoiler for those who were in the previous talk probably know the answer. Um, and also, by the way, MongoDB is licensed SSPL, so I don't know, maybe everything is okay. Uh, it wasn't just us being confused, it's uh, the community and um, 
following that and all of the uh, free and open messaging that got everyone confused, the OSI, the Open Source Initiative, the organization behind uh, uh, you know, the definitions of open source and the different licensing uh, establishment, uh, uh, released an announcement declaring that SSPL is not an open source license. It does not comply with the, with the open source definition. Uh, it discriminates against specific fields of endeavor. And essentially, it's, uh, as, as it said, a Foxpen source license. So um, the, the relicensing move obviously uh, created a lot of shock, uh, not just for us, for the entire community. Uh, the community was a turmoil, uh, you got lots of uh, responses, uh, no thanks, uh, you know, doubling down is not open at all. Uh, people said Elasticsearch and Kibana are now business risks. Um, Elastic promises open, delivers proprietary, uh, even angry bunny rabbits, which is really spooky. Uh, so really uh, um, a lot of uh, turmoil there. And shortly after, obviously, uh, the users started calling for uh, forking the project to keep it open source. I can tell you, we at, at Logs.io, we, in my company, we immediately started uh, looking into that and discussing with other community members and uh, exploring this option and being very clear that we think that this should be remain Apache 2 uh, licensed, uh, a far bigger organization, uh, AWS released uh, an announcement that they're going to be stepping up to uh, fork uh, and to uh, make sure that it's truly open source. Um, you got, you know, on the social media, wh whoever followed, so that the sentiment was very clear. People uh, preferred uh, an open source uh, AWS fork over uh, an elastic SSPL version uh, and that they will move to a fork uh, as soon as it's available. Uh, so the spirit was very much uh, in that uh, back in January uh, along these lines. So, so what happened with the relicensing and uh, what did the community do and uh, did the fork happen? I I'll get back to that later, I promise. But first, I want to step back and uh, connect back to also to the previous uh, uh, talks here on the uh, FOSS backstage. So what is open source anyway? Because we all know uh, OSS licenses, you know, Apache, MIT, BSD, uh, GNU, as approved by the OSI, uh, lots of talks, lots of material about this, uh, the licenses also today we've heard. But my question is, is having open source license enough to qualify an OSS project? And I hope that you started getting the message from even from this uh, small example that I gave that open source is more than just a license. Um, the question that we need to ask yourself is, is open source enough? And also what prevents a project from changing license? Uh, and who can change the license? The uh, OSI has a very nice slogan on its uh, uh, website. Uh, you can see that here, a screenshot, guaranteeing the R in, in source. And I like that because this is the essence of what we need to ask ourselves. We need to ask who is the R in source? Who governs the open source? And there are essentially three uh, options there. The, the vast majority of projects out there are uh, projects uh, run by individuals. Uh, popular example, then they could be individuals, but it could be even one or two, but still it could be massive. Like curl, that is, I think, like one maintainer and used by millions of devices. And, you know, from your washing machine to your car, it could be log4j. We all remember the uh, uh, all the noise around the, the vulnerability discovered, the, the log4j for, uh, for shell. Uh, recently, and uh, through the, the vulnerability, the CVE, we just realized how many use log4j, like over 8% of all the packages in Maven Central have had dependency on this uh, vulnerability. So, And it's maintained by two people, two maintainers. So this is the vast majority, main individuals. Uh, the other option is open source run by vendors. And we've seen the examples like Elastic NV uh, that uh, uh, is behind Elasticsearch. Uh, 
uh, mentioned Grafana Labs that uh, is behind the Grafana and Loki and Tempo and others and uh, MongoDB and many other examples uh, of vendor-owned uh, uh, open sources. And uh, lastly is foundations like Linux under the Linux Foundation, uh, Kubernetes under CNCF that's affiliated with the Linux Foundation, uh, Apache Kafka and, and many, many others. And, and the foundational open source, again, lots of discussions on that. I'm not going to delve into that, but generally... The, the, the benefit is that it's vendor neutral, it's multi-vendor, multi-player. You don't have one uh, to, uh, to own it and to take control uh, and uh, very uh, organized governance around, around this and very transparent. So now that we understand very uh, shortly uh, the, the options of, of uh, uh, who owns, who owns the hour in source, let's go look in, into three uh, case studies of uh, open source turning to the dark side. And the first one, uh, I'd like to uh, discuss open source going non-open source. Uh, and for that, I'll go back to the what I started uh, talking about, the Elasticsearch case study. So uh, we saw already the uh, announcement uh, about relicensing Elasticsearch and Kibana from Apache 2.0 to, uh, uh, AG, uh, sorry, to uh, SSPL. Um, and Elastic explained that, that it does that to fight off competitors, primarily AWS, that had commercial offerings based on the open source, while Elastic uh, invests uh, the, the vast majority to, to develop the open source, so to prevent free riding. Again, lots of discussions around that, so I'm not going to, uh, into that part now. Uh, and just to be fair, Elastic Envy is not a small company in itself. It's a, it's a public company. It's traded on NASDAQ. It's uh, 8.3 billion uh, US dollar market cap. Um, so that's it. And he didn't end up with that relicensing. All the rest of the components in the Elk stack uh, remained Apache 2.0. However, they started introducing breaking changes uh, to enforce um, them working with an official uh, certified uh, distro uh, of Elasticsearch. So, for example, if you use a file bit agent for reading log files and, and sending the logs to a remote Elasticsearch cluster, uh, then suddenly, uh, so starting version 7.13, uh, you had little checks for which uh, uh, version is the backend uh, cluster. And if it's not uh, officially supported, then it, it will just break. It will not work. Things that broke before, uh, worked before stop working. So we had that with uh, all the bits, uh, file bit, uh, metric bit, uh, packet bit, whatever. Also with the uh, logstash, uh, also users started detecting that in the client libraries. These are the libraries that you use to instrument your, uh, uh, your code base to send directly from your application. Uh, so uh, starting version 7.14 and others, people started noticing uh, similar checks. I think that the, the best description for those who are not from the uh, Elk stack uh, domain is, is uh, this description that says, imagine uh, you know, Oracle's MySQL team uh, deciding to fix uh, a MySQL client library so that they could only connect an official MySQL version. So it doesn't stop working with MariaDB, Percona, and others. That, that's essentially the impact. And by the way, very, very important, the breaking changes did not only break for not working with other distros like AWS and whoever, it also broke the compatibility with older open source versions. So if you used to work with uh, in Elasticsearch version 7.10 or older, it will stop <laughs> working with the open source versions there as well. So it was very, very problematic for the community. So as I mentioned before, uh, uh, the community started uh, calling to uh, create a fork uh, called OpenSearch. It was led by AWS together with Red Hat, SAP, Capital One, uh, and Logs.io. Uh, and, and you'd say, okay, so what's the problem? Just hit the fork button, right? It's an Apache 2 uh, project. But it, it, it appeared not to be that easy at all. Uh, what you can see here is... Um, is uh, the, the open search community updates from the forking work. And you can see, as soon as the developers started working on that, they realized quickly that Elasticsearch and Kibana code bases are entangled between Apache 2 and Elastic's uh, XPAC uh, uh, proprietary license, including, by the way, embedded XPAC license checks. So the team found itself like pulling proprietary and open source apart, and sometimes even traversing line by line, very tedious. 
in addition, they also inside they found embedded elastic marketing and branding elements, RSS feeds, uh, pop-up messages, dial home features, uh, telemetry fetched from the OSS to elastic servers, use of widgets that are not open, and, and so on. If you want to, by the way, to hear more about the, uh, the process, I'd highly recommend you to uh, check out the Open Observability Talks podcast. It was an episode I did with uh, Kyle from uh, AWS, where it very nicely outlines the journey uh, that was taken to, to actually make this fork happen. And luckily enough, OpenSearch uh, uh, was released in uh, April in, in beta and in uh, July in GA, which is less than half a year from since the, the bomb dropped on us, on all the community. That's, that's very, very impressive. Uh, and since the, it was released, uh, many moved to Elast from Elasticsearch to OpenSearch, including big names such as Dow Jones and Goldman Sachs and Pinterest and SAP and Zoom and Rackspace. Amazon, of course, moved its Amazon Elasticsearch service to OpenSearch. We at Logs.io moved to uh, OpenSearch. So uh, it was really a, a, a good, interesting experience. So Elasticsearch was an example of an uh, OSS moving to a non-OSI license, to a Foxpen uh, license, which is a, a clear case of uh, turning to the dark side. But remember what I said before. Uh, Open source is not about OSI licensing. Things can happen even within OSI licensing realm. And for that, I'd like to talk about uh, an example of going copyleft. Uh, and for that, I chose the Grafana uh, case study from, uh, again, the, the past year. Uh, Grafana, for those who don't know, it is a very popular uh, open source uh, for metrics, dashboarding, and monitoring. It's Apache 2.0 license backed by Grafana Labs. Uh, they also offer Loki for logs and, and Tempo for traces. And uh, April uh, last year, April 2021, uh, less than a year ago, Grafana Labs announced relicensing Grafana, Loki, and Tempo from Apache 2 to GNU AGPL version 3. Uh, and it also uh, did that to fend off competitors, leveraging the, the open source, so to uh, uh, fight off uh, free, free riders or something like that. Now, it's important to say AGPL uh, uh, version 3 is an OSI approved license that meets all the criteria of uh, free and open source software. So what's the problem, uh, right? But, but it is a problem. It's a new reality. People discovered that uh, the uh, OSS tool that they use is suddenly an infectious OSS, a copyleft license. And what does that mean? Again, they touched that on the previous talk, so I'll do that very briefly. Uh, and I'm not a lawyer, so uh, again, I'm, I'm putting it in layman terms, but in general, I took the example from Google, Google open source uh, policy, it's publicly available. And Google, for instance, doesn't allow AGP use. It says very clearly that it simply, the risks overweigh um, uh, the benefits, heavily overweigh the benefits. And why is that? The fact is that using AGPL software with modifications requires that anything it links to must also be licensed under AGPL, all the attack surface, if you'd like. So, so it spreads virally, so to speak, uh, which means that if you modify AGPL code or, or any copied or derived pieces from AGPL license code, you're at risk of needing to, uh, you're exposed. Uh, and in fact, uh, some say that even dynamic linking DLLs may be uh, prohibited or, or under this, uh, this restriction. And, and moreover, uh, this is triggered if the AGPL software is interacted with through a computer network. That's, that's section 13 of the license. That uh, means that, that you don't even need to uh, the product or the service to actually be distributed to customers. So in Google's case, or, or any SaaS uh, software as a service in that case, the core products are, are services that users interact with over the internet, right? So uh, AGPL is effectively rendered a business risk. Uh, and it's not just these uh, uh, cases. Even if you use that internally only, like internal systems purely, uh, uh, you still, for example, have, I don't know, contractors or vendors interacting, then uh, 
from the license perspective, they're users. So uh, if you uh, if they interact with some AGPL modified uh, uh, code base, you may find yourself needing to expose your full source code to a contractor you didn't even intend to expose to, or something like that. So it's not just uh, it's even for internal use. It, it, it's very problematic. Um, and it's not just problematic for vendors like Google and others. It's also problematic for other open source uh, projects uh, because of the license contamination issues. So, for example, the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, we issued uh, a special guidance following this relicensing saying that uh, projects under the CNCF should uh, switch to alternatives or freeze the used version and not upgrade to the relicensed version. Or, or ask for exceptions. So it is a problem also for open source projects. So these are cases of, of uh, going uh, copyleft and the, uh, for uh, Elasticsearch and Elastic and Grafana Labs, but it can also happen not just with vendors, also with individual contributors, which leads me to the uh, case of uh, open source going rogue, the case of two popular uh, NPM packages, Colors and, and Faker. Uh, both MIT licensed, I'm sure that you'll all agree, a very permissive license, uh, and both maintained by Marac Squares, um, which on January 5th uh, this year, uh, just a very short uh, while ago, uh, three months ago, he uh, deleted the source code of Feka and published the empty package to NPM as version 666, <laughs> very symbolic. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, Faker receives like 2 million weekly downloads and it's very popular also on JavaScript and Node.js projects. So you can just imagine what happened to those who upgraded the version uh, automatically. And it didn't end with Faker. Uh, three days later, on January 8th, uh, 2022, uh, he published uh, a version of Colors, uh, version 141, uh, where he uh, committed a, a, an infinite loop, essentially. Um, which creates a denial of service to everyone who runs that. And the colors, uh, open source uh, is, is, mu is much more popular than Faker. It's like 20 million downloads a week, uh, very key component in JavaScript and Node.js ecosystems, more than 4 million other projects on GitHub. Um, so you can imagine that the ripple effect that it immediately created. Um, including, by the way, uh, to AWS CDK, the Cloud Development Kit. So not just small projects, indeed. And th the community uh, reacted immediately. The, within a few hours, NPM had rolled back the Rogue release. Uh, and maybe more interestingly, GitHub suspended his uh, account in response, which is a controversial move by GitHub. Uh, let's admit, you know, he owns it. Uh, you, can ask, you can ask why can't he do whatever he likes with it. So I'm not going down this. This is a separate discussion, but it's definitely, let's say, it challenged some of the assumptions we have in the open source community. And um, Mark Rogue wrote a, a very interesting uh, blog post where he described it, how he did it, uh, monetizing open source is problematic. And he explained, uh, like the title says, that he's been working very hard on that. He hasn't seen any monetization. Large organizations have been capitalizing on it, and uh, he hasn't seen any, and they haven't contributed to the project. Again, very similar to what we've heard uh, before. So we saw case studies from past year or so on open source turning to the dark side, you know, going non-open source, going copyleft, going rogue. What can we learn from these cases? I'll share learnings for building an OSS, for using OSS, and for vetting your uh, OSS for your uh, companies. And let's start with building open source. If you're building open source, remember, open source isn't a business model. It's not uh, a problem of the commercial uh, vendors, as we've seen. It's a problem uh, with a commercial incentive. OSS isn't a business model. If you take one thing out of this talk, take this one. If you're a vendor, if you choose the OSS path, you should build a sustainable business model. Um, those who don't end up conf in conflict between the open source community needs and the business ones and end up relicensing defensively, just like what we've seen and the claims we've seen. Other, uh, others use open source, also your competitors. That's OSS premise. So make sure you create differentiation on your cloud service. 
there was a, a very interesting talk earlier today. So again, I'm not going down this, but definitely a point. And if you're a maintainer as well, if you decide to open source a project, don't expect material compensation. Yes, even if the large corps are, are going to benefit from it. There are enough opportunities out there to get paid for dev. That's not it. Uh, or establish a vendor entity around open source, like Confluent for Kafka, uh, Chronosphere for M3, and many others. And of course, if you go down this path and then go back to my uh, advice for vendors, that's for building open source. If you use open source, here are a few uh, tips to keep safe. First, manage your third-party licensing exposure, just like you do for, for secu third-party security exposure. Uh, prefer the less, least restrictive licenses, look for license contamination issues, and take care with automation. Um, make sure that you do license compliance checks before updating third party. Don't do auto updates with your uh, CI CD without any safeguards. Just think about those updating automatically from Elasticsearch 7.10 to 7.11, minor release, uh, without checking the license and what happened there. Another tip is, is code smells um, uh, that can signal upcoming uh, relicensing. It can buy you some time to act proactively. Uh, like if you remember in Elasticsearch and Kibana, mixed code uh, licenses, telemetry, dial home, and things like that. I, I uh, think about the just hit the fork test. So obviously you don't need to actually fork, but if you are familiar with the code base and you see that it's going to be very tricky to fork, that should be a code smell for you. Um, and uh, if you uh, find yourself needing to tweak uh, the open source uh, to suit your needs, prefer extending the functionality with plugins over downstream code modifications because uh, vendors will more easily block you from uh, modifying code uh, with licensing rather than extensions via plugins. So that's for using open source and for vetting a new open source for your company. Here are a few things to consider. First, very clearly, which uh, OSS license prefer, you know, Apache 2, MIT, BSD, the, the least restrictive. Uh, but also, don't, don't forget who's behind the open source, preferably not a one-man show. That's a bottleneck and a, a very dangerous path. If it's a vendor, remember that it, license may change if a conflict comes uh, into place. So prefer foundational open source to be the safest uh, and, and the, the most transparent one. Also understand what's the governance policy for foundational or, not, or others. How do they ensure no single entity grabs control? What's the promotion path to becoming a contributor, becoming a maintainer, who can review, who can approve PRs, ultimately who can decide on relicensing as well. Um, and um, if you look for a safer path, you can also, also always consider vendors supporting the open source with their distros, you know, a packaging of the upstream project uh, that is delivered as a product that uh, includes usually an indemnification, so effectively an insurance policy from, from these lawsuits and all of these uh, legal mess, including support and, and certified to run hardware the, uh, platforms. That, that's for the on-prem preference. For those for man go for managed, you have SaaS offerings for the open source. And remember, on the other hand, that using vendors may involve some delay in, in getting the latest from the upstream. So important to check. So just to summarize what we've seen, um, we've seen that open source is more than a license. We've seen that open source can turn to the dark side. Uh, it can be relicensed, it can go rogue. So you need to select open source wisely, which license, who's behind the project, which governance policy, and so on. You need to use open source wisely, manage the licenses, don't automate updates without safeguards, code smells, and build open source wisely. Remember, open source isn't a business model. Uh, I've written, by the way, a, a blog post about it. I called it, is vendor-owned open source uh, an oxymoron? So you're welcome to scan the QR code or just Google it up. I, I take this discussion a bit further with the uh, regards to the op vendor-owned open source. And most importantly, this takeaway, always ask yourselves, who's the hour in source? I'm Dutan Horvitz, uh, thank you very much, and uh, may the open source be with you. And uh, I hope there's time for, for questions there. Uh, yeah, thanks for this amazing talk. Um, we technically don't have time, but we actually have time because there's a break upcoming now, and I would say we just 
take a bit of that break uh, for you to ask, answer a few questions. Um, okay, the, the first one is, um, um, is documenting licenses and monitoring changes part of a company's SBOM? Uh, what are the department's roles in a company responsible for identifying and mitigating the impact of license changes? Um, for example, a contingency plan, um, security, um, the OSPO, who was in charge of that? That, that's a very extensive uh, question. Yeah. I'll, try, <laughs> I'll try and cover, but maybe we uh, we can carry it on on the uh, on the breakout room later. I can say uh, very shortly that uh, I, I look at it very much like uh, I, I mentioned that briefly on the talk. I look at it like like people look at security because I, I'm giving that as an example just because security uh, is is much more evolved in many of these organizations. So uh, it's really dependent on the size of the organization and the structure of the organization. Uh, who will, will take ownership of that if it's under the uh, chief data officer or a chief uh, the CISO or the CTO or whoever. I'm not going to into the roles because it's really dependent. But the ver very important thing is that there is very clear uh, gating and very clear uh, safeguards, uh, especially, especially, and again, because of this, the, the, the trend to go to the lean, agile movement and doing automation, this should be an integral part of the, of the release pipeline. You don't automatically upgrade uh, to the latest without safeguards on the security. Do the same on the licensing. Make sure that you have, and obviously not everything can be fully automated. So at least raise the flag if the, you know, just compare. If the license is identical, go ahead with the automation. If the license is changed, uh, raise an alert and have someone look into that and, and see what the, what the implications are. Or something as, as simple as that. If you have uh, more elaborate uh, automation, that's fine. But just don't uh, neglect to look into that. That's, uh, I guess, and uh, about roles, it's really dependent on the organizational uh, uh, structure. If you have OSPO, I, I think this is definitely, should be done at least in collaboration with, if not uh, owned by, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question is um, maybe a bit of a look into the, into the crystal ball. Um, what are um, other projects that you see that might be at risk of, of changing the license, uh, license like Elastic did? Well, that's, uh, I, I mean, I'm not a prophet, so it's, it's very difficult to say. You know, some said after the Grafana Labs relicensed its projects to AGPL that it will be just the first stage and the, and the and additional relicensing will come later down the road. I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. I can say uh, that I, I would use the same sensors. Maybe instead of crystal balls, I can give you and I can equip you with the advice that I gave on the talk. Maybe elaborate a bit more about that. Try and see if there is if if the the vendor behind if if there is let's if you use a, a foundational open source, you're much in a, on a more in a safer ground. Okay. You know that there is a clear governance. You need to open the governance and see, but probably you're in a safer ground because the, the neutrality is, is baked into the governance. Um, but then again, and by the way, there were relicensing also under foundations like uh, in, in uh, Eclipse uh, that there was some relicensing. So it's not that it's not there, but the, the logic should be more consistent and transparent. Um, and then the question is, if, if the vendor behind it is one that creates differentiation on, on its cloud services. If they manage to build a sustainable business model that is independent of the core value of the open source, then it's less of a risk of, of being in contention between the open source and the, uh, uh, and the commercial needs, let's put it this way. So if you start feeling that, that they don't have much of a differentiation and, and added value on top of that, that's, I guess, something that is, uh, is, uh, could be a signal. Another one that I said, for those who are involved in the open source themselves, like, people developed on Elasticsearch or people develop on Grafana or things like that and know the code intimately, as I said, sometimes they can detect some code smells that can give them a sense that at least it might uh, happen. So these are the indicators, the sensors that I would put out uh, if for, for at least for the stack that you use uh, in your house or that you're vetting now to, to adopt. 